Recently, there's been a huge increase in the interest in the medicinal uses of cannabis and hemp plants. Numerous therapies have been proposed, many of which derive from active compounds such as cannabidiol, abbreviated CBD, and Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, or THC. The major difference between these two so-called cannabinoids is that THC is known to have psychotropic effects, whereas CBD is non-psychoactive. But do these chemicals have any application for the prevention or treatment of Alzheimer's disease? I've started to look into this question, and here's some of what I found about the current state of this constantly evolving research. First of all, you have to understand that I am not a doctor and I'm not a research scientist. My training is in philosophy and academic research. My aim in videos like this is to make viewers aware of some of the relevant literature. So this presentation is for general informational or entertainment purposes only. Nothing that I say herein or in any other video on this channel is intended as medical advice. Think of it as me providing you with leads that you're free to follow up on or not as you see fit. And there are plenty of interesting leads to follow up on. I'll hit a few highlights. For example, in a report from 1998 in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences of the United States, the authors refer to both CBD and THC as neuroprotective antioxidants. Let's break down that phrase. In general, a neuroprotectant is a chemical or drug that may safeguard brain or nerve cells from injury or that may even restore some level of function in the event that neurons are damaged. One aspect of this protection has to do with inflammation. According to the provocatively titled The Pot Book, published by Simon & Schuster, quote, neuroinflammation is key to both autoimmune disorders, such as multiple sclerosis, and neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and Huntington's disease. It's interesting and highly relevant, therefore, as one future medicinal chemistry article puts it, that cannabinoids are potent anti-inflammatory agents. Quote, Research suggests that cannabinoids might be especially useful in minimizing inflammatory responses in the brain itself, symptoms of which are believed to be key to many serious neurodegenerative diseases, ranging from Alzheimer's dementia to Parkinson's disease to other related motor disorders. But reportedly, they also serve another vital function, fighting oxidation. This is to say that cannabinoids function as antioxidants. These are substances that counteract or minimize the harmful effects of a vexing group of unstable molecules known as free radicals. These compounds are released when the body's cells interact with oxygen in a fundamental physiological process termed oxidation. But normal oxidation can become dysfunctional when an imbalance between free radicals and antioxidants develops in your body. This condition results in or is termed oxidative stress. Free radicals accumulate inside of us, and because of their reactivity, they can cause or help to cause a wide assortment of bad effects, including cancer. Antioxidants help try to fight against these unfavorable outcomes and restore balance. I've talked about herbal antioxidants in several videos already, with a special focus on those that are commonly located on kitchen spice racks. Admittedly, the present compounds are a little more exotic, even if that's partially an artifact of various legislation, politics, or other regulation. But CBD and THC, both separately and together, have therapeutic potential due to these antioxidant and neuroprotective capabilities. In fact, CBD and THC function as well or better than other powerful antioxidants. For example, when it comes to mitigating the effects of such things as the iron oxidizing Fenton reaction, which may itself be directly implicated in Alzheimer's disease. CBD in particular is so potent an antioxidant that it outperforms common varieties of vitamin C and E, namely ascorbate and alpha tocopherol. And both of these are known to be antioxidant and neuroprotective dynamos. Besides attempting to counteract oxidation and to provide anti-inflammatory neuroprotection, cannabinoids are being investigated for their potential relevance to dementia in other ways. For example, commonly cited hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease include the reduction in the brain of the neurotransmitter acetylcholine and the pathological accumulation of two types of misfolded proteins, amyloid beta and tau. Together, these dysfunctional aggregations are known as plaques and tangles. And it turns out that cannabinoids hold promise in addressing some of these other concerns as well. For example, according to a 2014 article in the scientific journal Frontiers in Pharmacology, THC boosts acetylcholine levels by inhibiting acetylcholinesterase. 
For more insight into this admittedly confusing operation, see the video that I dedicated to trying to better explain this roundabout mechanism. Suffice it to say that acetylcholinesterase inhibiting drugs like Aricept, Cognex, Exelon, and Rivastigmine have historically been the go-to pharmaceutical level interventions for Alzheimer's. Again, see some of my previous work for more. It's intriguing, therefore, that according to one provocative study published in 2006, THC performs this acetylcholinesterase inhibiting function better than the widely prescribed denepazil, also known as Aricept, and at lower concentrations. The same basic finding was confirmed as recently as 2020. Additionally, acetylcholine deficiency has been correlated with or linked to extracellular and intracellular amyloid beta accumulation, which THC may also reduce. Once again, THC may outpace Aricept as well as other drugs like the now obsolete Cognex. Not to be outdone, CBD also reduces amyloid beta production and appears to partially neutralize something called APP. This is the amyloid precursor protein from which amyloid beta derives. And if that weren't remarkable enough, CBD also seems to have a beneficial effect on tau protein dysfunction. For these reasons, one company recently created Sativex, a drug that combines, you guessed it, CBD and THC. Sativex, whose chemical name is often given as nabiximols, is said to help decrease both neuroinflammation as well as plaque and tangle accumulation. Some researchers claim that these actions result in measurable improvements in certain types of learning and memory retention scenarios. Of additional interest is the observation that CBD and THC both protect the brain against the poisonous effects of two high levels of the excitatory neurotransmitter glutamate. Glutamate is a vital component of the nervous system's signal processing and transmission apparatus. Glutamate toxicity can affect several neural structures and it can take several different pathways depending on the receptors involved. These cannabinoids give the brain protection regardless of what receptor is implicated, whether it is kinate, propionic acid, or N-methyldeaspartate, that is NMDA. This is remarkable, especially since excess glutamate is also the therapeutic target of the pharmaceutical grade Alzheimer's drug Memantine, sold in the US as Namenda except memantine only guards the NMDA type receptors. And this is certainly one reason why researchers are looking to cannabinoids for inspiration. One of the fruits of these investigations is the compound known as HU211, which is being studied for possible clinical applications. HU211, also sometimes known as dexanabinol, is a synthetic cannabinoid. This means that it is part of a class of laboratory-created chemicals that is designed to emulate the actions and effects of natural constituents of cannabis plants. Like other similar compounds, such as now widely controlled or illegal marijuana knockoffs, such as the street drugs known as K2 or Spice, HU211 has a different mechanism. When considered for its psychoactive properties, cannabis affects so-called cannabinoid receptors in the brain. On the other hand, and like natural cannabinoids and the Alzheimer's drug memantine, HU211 acts as an NMDA antagonist, a complex topic that I may explore in a forthcoming video. And so HU211 is also being looked at for treating such afflictions as brain cancer, dementia, head injury, and stroke. But for that matter, the real deal cannabinoids are also impressing some researchers for possible use in addressing a host of other ailments apart from dementia. Besides Alzheimer's disease, for example, CBD is also being investigated for possible pharmacological and therapeutic roles in such illnesses as anxiety disorders, epilepsy, ischemia reperfusion injury, inflammatory conditions, and other neuropsychiatric disorders. Now, before I conclude, let me back up and say a few words about plant terminology, because it's a source of potential confusion. Trying to get a handle on the difference between hemp and marijuana can leave you a little dazed and confused. First of all, the words themselves are used in different contexts. It's not in the first place a distinction of scientific nomenclature. Reportedly, hemp and marijuana are both technically the same species, although even here you have some confusion. Some sources apparently list at least three subtypes, cannabis sativa, cannabis indica, and cannabis ruderalis. Other sources combine subtypes or even condense them all into the single cannabis sativa. Sometimes it seems that hemp is used for the plant itself 
while the word marijuana is often used for the plant's aerial products, especially as they pertain to recreational purposes. Other times, the word hemp is used to designate cannabis plants that are cultivated for industrial applications, while marijuana picks out those plants grown for drug use. Further confusing things is the fact that both hemp and marijuana may be mentioned in medical and therapeutic contexts. I found one of the clearest and most enlightening statements of an actual sustainable distinction being drawn between them in an article by the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine. The authors wrote, quote, hemp naturally contains significantly more cannabidiol, up to 40% more, compared to marijuana. Marijuana, on the other hand, is primarily grown to maximize the THC content, which can reportedly be up to 40% more in some hybridized plants. So even though you can say hemp for CBD, marijuana for THC, it is still the case that CBD is actually present in both. Related to this is the further requirement that hemp plants must contain a THC content of 0.3% or less, whereas marijuana plants are those that contain over 0.3%. However, potentially this is still a somewhat vague demarcation since the THC content of a hemp plant can change over time, depending on several factors, including growing conditions. In fact, this is a real concern for farmers seeking to grow legal hemp as plants hitting too high THC content, sometimes referred to as hot hemp, must be destroyed. Once again, nothing I say or that appears on this channel should be taken as healthcare advice. Your first step always and everywhere should be to arrange a consultation with a licensed and trusted professional in your area, someone who is familiar or who can be familiarized with your specific situation. That said, at the time of this recording, here's how things shake out. According to the Business Insider, quote, 16 states and Washington, D.C. have legalized marijuana for adults over the age of 21, and 36 states have legalized medical marijuana, meaning that a majority of Americans have access to marijuana, whether medically or recreationally, end quote. However, it's important to register the fact that some of these products, or administration routes, come with possible drawbacks and risks. For example, according to WebMD, oral cannabis is possibly unsafe at least over the long term. And if it has significant THC content, it can result in numerous undesirable symptoms, including anxiety, psychosis, heart attack, and irregular heart rhythm. Daily long-term use might even cause so-called cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome, or CHS, a nasty condition characterized by uncontrollable nausea and vomiting. Rarely, CHS is so severe as to potentially lead to death. Additional concerns pertain to the possibility of chemical dependence and withdrawal, which can prompt users to experience nervousness, shaking, trouble sleeping, decreased appetite, sweating, headache, and depressed mood, many of which symptoms already characterize some people's experiences with neurodegenerative disorders like Alzheimer's. And this mainstream source doesn't consider inhalation to be much better, again, at least over the long haul. One reason for this is that the spectrum of possible side effects, including headache, dizziness, drowsiness, dry mouth, nausea, paranoid thinking, and impaired mental function, overlap with and therefore have the potential to aggravate symptoms that dementia already has. In fact, long-term cannabis smoking can irritate the respiratory system, precipitating breathing problems like wheezing and coughing, and even after chronic use, lung damage. Though, for ideas on how to use cannabis and other herbs without inhalation or ingestion, see my previous video. Finally, WebMD considers cannabis extract spray, such as the pharmaceutical Sativex surveyed earlier, and it considers it possibly safe. This is despite the fact that the website acknowledges that Sativex may be associated with some of the same negative side effects as other delivery routes. Finally, WebMD notes that Sativex has not been approved as a prescription product in the U.S., at least not at the time of this recording. Side effects for the non-psychoactive cannabinoid CBD are arguably a little less worrisome. Nevertheless, the prestigious Mayo Clinic observes that CBD also carries some risks. These include possible side effects such as dry mouth, diarrhea, reduced appetite, drowsiness, fatigue, and negative drug interactions such as with blood thinners. The journal Cannabis and Cannabinoid Research also relates that CBD may have an effect on the hormones. I'll give the final word to that publication, which also notes, quote, some important toxicological parameters are yet to be studied. Additionally, more clinical trials with a greater number of participants and longer chronic CBD administration are still lacking. In other words, although cannabis-related products are promising, more investigation is required. If you'd like to see any follow-up video, then I invite you to subscribe to this YouTube channel 
or check back. If you click the notification bell, you will be alerted to new content as it becomes available. If you found something of use or value in this presentation though, I do ask you to click like to show your support. But either way, I thank you so much for joining me today and I look forward to seeing you again in another video. Thank you so much.